Well, folks, the stock market insanity has officially started. The next 25 trading days are going to be crazy. I mean, absolutely crazy. We have so many massive things that are about to transpire that I'm going to take you through in this video and exactly what's going on there. We're also going to address what do you do during this time period? We know September is usually a really bad month for the stock market. We usually know, at least in recent years, the stock market has bottomed in mid-October. Do you even bother buying over the next few weeks or do you kind of wait till, let's say, let's call it early or mid-October? Okay. We'll also speak about, do you buy some puts on some stocks out there or some good opportunities from kind of the, the downside risk if this market does downtrend over this next month or two? Do we have some big money that's to be made on the downside? So we'll speak about all that in this video. There's a lot to go through. I want to jump straight in this. Appreciate y'all joining me. All asking return. Smash that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel here, folks. And let's get it going. And by the way, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I swear that I love it. I love when there's drama in the market, baby. That's 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 when things are really, really fun, okay? So first thing, we got to get politics out of the way. Listen, over this next 25 trading days, politics will move the stock market. And the reason being is we have the first presidential debate. This is not just the first presidential debate. This is potential. This could be the only presidential debate, by the way, depending upon many various factors. This is the one that matters the most. The first one's always the one that matters the most. It always gets the most attention. And usually after that point, it's hard to make a big change or one way or another. So depending upon who does really good in this presidential debate, whoever is kind of Let's call it they haven't chose. Like, you know, there's certain, there's a, most people have already chose in their mind. They're either voting for Trump or they're voting for Harris. Okay. It was one or the other. But there's still a select amount of people that are in that kind of in between gray zone that they don't really know. And this, this presidential debate on September 10th is going to matter significantly. Now, as far as the polls go right now, they all do have Harris ahead. Now, one, just because the polls show a certain way, doesn't mean it's going to be that way in terms of who wins the election, but it does show that as of right now. I like to look at it more on those swing states, the ones that are, you know, could go either way and kind of what I'm seeing there. North Carolina looks pretty dang even. Arizona, I think Team Man's going to probably win Arizona, but that's a pretty dang even, right? Georgia's pretty dang even. Michigan's very, very close. Nevada, the state I live in, very, very close. So this is what you got to understand, like, you know, this debate is going to be everything. I mean, absolutely everything. And people are, that are that are on the sideline, they're going to make up their mind after the debate on who they're really going with. Pennsylvania, very, very close. Wisconsin, very, very close. Florida, I think T-Man's got Florida in the bag as far as that goes, right? Now, in regards to the market, the market's going to look at this in a, in a meaningful way because there's risks to both candidates in regards to how the stock market looks at this. They're different risks, though. That's what you got to understand. Both are risks to the market, but they're different risks. From the Harris side, the big risk is taxes, right? We've heard about some of our stances on taxes. None of those bode well for the stock market. If you talk about taking the corporate tax rate up to 28% from 21%, that's not going to be good for the stock market. We've obviously heard recently about the whole unrealized gains thing. The stock market doesn't like that. So the risk for Harris is really around taxes and what that would mean for investors in the stock market. The risk for, for Trump on his side is tariffs, right? Tariffs at the end of the day are a very inflationary thing. And so if you do talk about tariffs that could affect Chinese stocks, that could affect Chinese companies, the Chinese economy, what happens there? Do things escalate for a tick for tack back and forth game? We know there's a lot of American companies that get significant amounts of money from China and other international markets. If you have a, a tariff trade war, next thing you know, right? A lot of those other companies can be hurt in a very significant way. So that's going to matter significantly, and we'll see how it goes. But I can tell you that will shake the market in a meaningful way. It's just a question, is, is the market going to get shaken by taxes or by tariffs here? Now, next up here, NVIDIA. Oh, boy. Okay. Listen, obviously, NVIDIA stock's been the most talked about stock for a year and a half now. Over a year and a half, right? It's the most talked about stock. It's been the most important stock to the stock market for over a year and a half now at this point in time. And... This stock fell almost 10% here today, down 9.5%. It obviously fell on earnings, even though it was an A-plus income statement. It had other issues in terms of decelerations of growth and some of those sorts of things. Margins obviously coming down. The stock's down after hours as well. We'll talk about in just a moment why the stock's down after hours. It's down 13.6% just in the past five trading days. And there's just really zero positive momentum going on in regards to NVIDIA right now. Everything that's positive, we already knew about. The numbers are really strong. 
guidance is strong. Everybody and their grandma knew that. The numbers are going to be good for 25. Everybody and their grandma knows that. There's no debating that. So you can't get, you got to get positive momentum coming from things you didn't see. Products, new services that you didn't know about. We already know about Blackwell chip. We know about all this. The only things we're starting to find out now are more negative things, right? Ooh, margins are off. Oh, you know, bigger deceleration of growth than a lot of folks were anticipating. The beats in regards to their revenue and EPS much lower than a lot of people on Wall Street and a lot of investors were expecting. A lot of traders were expecting a lot bigger beats for guidance and for the numbers. So you have kind of zero positive momentum going right now, right? And now the big question is, can it get this momentum back, right? Additionally, the Department of Justice, this just came out after the bell here today, the Department of Justice issued a subpoena in an antitrust investigation into NVIDIA. Shares are trading lower after hours on Tuesday after the company received a subpoena from the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, a subpoena is just a fancy way of saying NVIDIA has to respond to this. You can't just blow this off, okay? They, they, they have no choice. According to Bloomberg report, the Department of Justice sent subpoena to NVIDIA and other companies in an escalation of its investigation into possible antitrust law violations by the AI computing giant. The Department of Justice is concerned with whether NVIDIA penalizes buyers that don't exclusively use NVIDIA chips and if the company is making it difficult for customers to switch to other chip suppliers. According to the report, the investigation is being led by the Department of Justice's San Francisco office. We'll see. We'll see what happens with this. But at the end of the day, things like this, it's a shoot first, ask questions later situation. So that's the way people will look at this. So like Department of Justice, what if they change the way NVIDIA has to do business? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. What if they levy huge fines against NVIDIA? I think huge fines aren't the big problem. NVIDIA is making so much money right now. They're going to keep making so much money in 2025 as well. Even if the Department of Justice fined them a few billion dollars, it's, 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 it's a can of soda. It's nothing to them. But if the Department of Justice forced NVIDIA to change their business model and make certain things so other chips, so that could be a little bit of a different situation, right? So we'll see where all that goes. All I know is it's a shoot, shoot first, ask questions later. And for a stock that already lost momentum, right, it just adds more kind of insult to injury. And we'll see kind of what happens here. Additionally, here today, AMD, big news came out. This is very positive for AMD, although AMD stock certainly didn't go positive today. That stock was down huge today, not as much as NVIDIA, but still huge. AMD hires AI expert from NVIDIA. Advanced Micro Devices has appointed Keith Steer, Stir, however you pronounce his name, NVIDIA's Vice President of Worldwide Artificial Intelligence Initiatives to be its Senior Vice President of Global AI Markets. The chipmaker said Tuesday, that this gentleman, Keith, will be responsible for expanding the company's AI vision and accelerating strategic AI enhancements across the public and private sectors. According to his LinkedIn, this gentleman has served or has been with NVIDIA since August 2019. I'm sure he made a lot of money. Oh boy, I'm sure his stock options are looking dang good. And spent five years before that at EY, where he served as the firm's first global AI leader. AMD said Tuesday that this gentleman was responsible for expanding NVIDIA's commercial in engagements with foreign governments. He will now report to the AMD chief technology officer, Mark Papermaster. What a name, man. Papermaster, who that gentleman, he's basically right under Lisa Su. So Lisa, uh, so this 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 gentleman right here, this Mark, right, he reports to Lisa Su. And this this gentleman is obviously in a very important role, so he reports to, to this man. So basically, he's just two rungs underneath Lisa Su. So a very important title he's coming in at AMD, right? This gentleman said in a statement that he was honored to join AMD at this pivotal moment. My goal is to make the transformational power of AI more accessible and inclusive for people around the world. And I'm excited about this clear opportunity to advance this mission at AMD. Transformative, by the way. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of, a, it's just a, there's just a lot of just negative things going on for AMD in the short term, right? And the only positives are the numbers and we all know the numbers are great. Like, like there's no question, like Blackwell demands crazy. We all know that. But you have all these other things, the Department of Justice now, this man gets stolen away. And so it just kind of creates concern out there around that. And what does that mean for the market? We'll have to see, obviously. You know, and I said this a few months ago, I said the most important stock to the stock market for the last year and a half has been NVIDIA, right? But I'd let you guys know that Apple really moving forward is going to become the most important stock again, because Apple's kind of the one that is seen as the next, what do we have a super cycle? And that leads us to Apple, right? And Apple, the ninth, 
they're going to show off their new iPhones. They're going to show off other devices as well. I, from what I'm hearing, they're going to show off a new pair of AirPods. From what I'm hearing, they're going to show off a new Apple Watch. But the iPhones are going to be the, the center of attention. Okay, So that's going to be obviously next week. That's in a few trading days from now. Now, Apple's rolling heavy into this. 26.5% this stock is up in the past six months. And this is with their numbers not even being good. Apple's numbers have not been good the last two quarters. Look at those numbers. They're not impressive. And by Apple standards, they're horrible. Horrible. But Apple's been rolling heavy into this. And there's a lot of excitement around Apple, AI, these new iPhones, right? All those sort of things. And so here's the deal. If you're wondering, is Apple stock likely to go up or down after they show off these new iPhones? This goes ahead and shows you the history around Apple stock on iPhone launch days. And what you're going to find is the majority of time, guess what? Apple on the release date, the stock goes down. Now, from the announcement of they're going to come out with these new iPhones to that announcement day, the stock usually does pretty well. And then one week after the release, the stock does actually pretty dang bad overall, right? So it's just a little food for thought in regards to that. A lot of times people get excited going into the new iPhone day. Oh, man, it's going to be so exciting. And then they're just kind of let down and then the stock actually falls that, that day. The stock falls over the next week. So just a little food for thought in regards to that. And Apple's obviously the biggest market cap in the stock market by quite a large, I don't want to say by a large margin. Microsoft's pretty close by. But now NVIDIA, since NVIDIA's dropped so, so significantly, now... Uh, Clearly, Apple's like the big dog of big dogs out there. So what happens with Apple here, we shall see. Now, keep in mind, on the WDC day, when they did that keynote, right, the stock fell on that day. And that was supposed to be an extremely exciting day that a lot of people had looked into, look forward to because Apple, we hadn't really heard too much about what they're going to do with it in regards to AI. People got excited about that. The stock ended up negative. So that's just a little food for thought in regards to that. If you had a bet one way or another, the, the, there's a higher probability that Apple is lower you know, a week from now or two weeks from now than it is today, I guess you can say. Okay. Now that leads us to Tesla. Also a very important stock in the stock market. Obviously Tesla is not nearly as important as it once was. One, the market cap's fallen a lot over the past couple of years. We know this used to be a $400 stock. That's one thing. The second reason a Tesla is not important is it hasn't really had the momentum for several years now. Let's just call it what it is, right? There was a moment where Tesla was like NVIDIA. Before there was NVIDIA, there was Tesla, right? Tesla was all the hype in the market. They had the most extreme numbers and everybody was convinced that like, you know, EVs were just going to grow 50% of plus a year for all of eternity. Obviously, that did not come true, right? EVs are still the future. EVs are still, you know, the play. But... The growth rates are very uneven, right? That's what people are going to finally realize with NVIDIA over the next few years. They're going to realize, oh my gosh, this was you know great time in terms of the chip sales, 23, 24, 25. But then they're going to realize, oh, you know, in 26 and 27, oh, it's not just up in, in 50% plus a year, just like the people had to realize with Tesla, right? And so Tesla's not as important in the market as it used to be, but it's still important. It's still one of the biggest market caps in the stock market, right? Now, keep in mind, Tesla's been rolling here recently. It's up about 14% in the past month, which is a pretty significant move. Now, keep in mind, October 10th, right, is a big Tesla day. They're supposed to show off their next generation vehicle. They're supposed to show off their autonomous taxi vehicle and, and how all that's going to work and get into the tech and, and all those sorts of things, right? There's People are looking forward to that. What does it mean for the app? Are they going to make some major changes there? I mean, there's so much there that people are going to be looking forward to in that particular day. It should be a very intensive day in regards to what Elon Musk and the team are going to show off. But that's going to matter significantly. And what does Tesla stock do prior to that, right? I think that's a big, big question. What does Tesla stock do going in? My guess is Tesla stock is going to roll heavy at the end of September going into the beginning of October. It's going to be a hype thing. And then... The, then, then if that does transpire, the only way Tesla stock's going to keep going up after that is they're going to just have to have a 10 a 10 day. Like it's going to have to be the most insane stuff you've ever seen. Like it's going to have to shock people, blow their minds, and, and everybody's going to have to like want to own Tesla stock after that day. It wouldn't have to be a 10 a 10 day. But that's my guess on kind of what happens there. There's going to be a lot of excitement. I wouldn't be surprised if, if especially if the, the NASDAQ's negative for the next couple of weeks, I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of people position into call options for these couple of weeks, a bunch of people make money in the short term. We'll see what happens there. But Tesla Day is going to be huge for the market. Unemployment rate, okay? We're going to get two different unemployment reports really in the next, you know, we can say 30 trading days or so, right? Now, these, obviously, 
the trend has been higher, right, in regards to unemployment rate, which is not good. That's not something you want to see really ever in the economy where just month after month it seems like the unemployment rate is just going higher. What we need in these next two months is we need essentially to stable out this unemployment rate. If we can do that over these next two un unemployment reports, that could be really positive. Because right now people are looking, and if, if next thing you know, we see we go to 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, you know, I'm just going to be honest, people are going to start getting really freaked out of this market. They're going to say, the hard landing is coming. The hard landing is coming. If these next two reports are basically unemployment went up significantly, I'm telling you guys, the market is going to start to freak. They're going to start to they're going to start to go from people. Majority of actually market participants right now are expecting a soft landing. If we got all of a sudden, next thing you know, let's say the next report was a 4.5, and the next report after that's a 4.6. All of a sudden, market participants are going to go from soft landing expected to hard landing expected, and what that would do for valuations. And what that would do for the stock market is down significantly. When I say down significantly, I'm talking 10% plus. We're not talking small numbers here. We're talking double digits. If you talked about Wall Street, Golson got convinced, <laughs> you know, hard landing instead of soft landing where we're at, it would be bad, okay? So as long as things are stable, that could be a positive because then people will say holiday season comes, Unemployment rate could even potentially drop in that particular time. And then we'll see what happens in 2025. We need stability in regards to unemployment rate. If we could stay 4.4 or under, would be very, very good. For the market, if we go above that, ooh boy, people are going to panic, panic out there, okay? Now, all eyes are on the Federal Reserve, September 17th and the 18th. All eyes are on the Fed. And the reason being is that's their big meeting. They're going to have their big press conference. They're going to they're gonna likely lower interest rates, right? That was, I would say that's like a 90% probability right now they're going to lower interest rates. But there's a few risk factors here, okay? First, how much do they lower by? Some people want the Fed to lower by 25. Some people want the Fed to lower by 50. I'm one of those that I think the Fed should be lowering by 50. I think the Fed should already be lowering, especially... I'll go into some of that in just a moment. But the bottom line is, if they only go 25, there's going to be a lot of market participants that aren't happy with that. They're going to say the Fed's lowering too slow. And that's going to essentially cause a situation where the Fed's going to be way behind the curve and they're going to have to get into panic cutting. Panic cutting would be 75 basis points or more. That would be a, a really bad situation. And you want to talk about the market really freaking out? If next thing you know, the Fed's cutting 75 or more, panic mode in the market. Panic mode. You can get away with 25s and 50s. Everybody just looks at that as like, okay, they're moving in a direction. You do 75 or more, panic. No different than... Also, when they had to start doing the 75 basis point up, 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 people were panicking out there because they're like, oh my gosh, the Fed's just going higher and higher and higher. They're, they're, they've lost all control of inflation. If they lose all control of the economy, it would be very, very bad. So all eyes are on the Fed. And then also the other big risk is if for any reason they did not cut interest rates, oh boy, oh boy, <laughs> you want to talk about the market freaking out, that would be a freak out. That's insanely low probability. I would call less than 10% probability the Fed doesn't cut rates at all. Now, this is very important what I'm showing you here right now. This looks at the Fed funds rate versus CPI, right? Now, look back here. The Fed was way behind the curve, obviously. Inflation was destroying people, while the Fed obviously had very low interest rates, right? And this is what caused the massive amount of inflation. If you're wondering how did we have the highest inflation we had in decades and decades and decades, there's a few different reasons, but this is one of the biggest components. If the Fed keeps interest rates insanely low while CPI is going higher and higher, it's, it's disastrous, right? And you're going to end up in a big problem. Additionally, if the Fed is basically above CPI by too much for too long, that sets the economy up for a potential big crash. And if you look here, look at the issue. Do we need a tissue? Look at this, folks. We are now significantly, way significantly, and it's not new, it's been going on for almost a year now, where we are way above the CPI rate in terms of Fed funds, which, you know, last time we were here for any extended amount of time, right before the great financial crisis, right before the great financial crisis. That does not make me feel great. <laughs> I can tell you that. Anytime I got to back things up and I'm like, oh, last time we did this, it was right before the great financial crisis. It doesn't make me feel comfortable, right? It doesn't make me feel good. But we have one of those time periods right now. And so this is a significant risk to the market. We'll see what happens. Um, but it's not good. It's not good. And this is why the Fed needs to be lowering 50 basis points 
September, 50 basis points November, get us down 100 basis points ASAP, and then start to look out there, see what happens. See see what happens in 2025. Do we need to keep going 50, 50s, and 50s? We'll keep going there, right? But this is not good, and it bodes very poor for us. Now, if we look at the trueflation numbers, trueflation today has us at 1.22% as far as the inflation rate goes, right? Now, you may say, I don't know if I believe trueflation. Hmm. What would you, what do you believe more, trueflation numbers or do you believe the government data? Because I have question marks more about the government data. The government data can't really be trusted. I think trueflation is more accurate than, than the government's accurate. That's my personal opinion in regards to that. I think the unemployment rate's insane, or excuse me, the, uh, tr- the inflation rate is insanely low right now and it's lower than what the government says. So it was also, in my opinion, it was higher than what the government had. I think we actually were significantly above 9% CPI um, back in, in kind of 22 when, when they had it at 9%. I think we were actually double digits during that particular time. Now, next up here, commodities. Now, over the next 25 trading days in the market, it's going to be very important to pay attention to commodities. Okay, This is, looks at GSG. This is a commodity basket, the commodity index in general, right? What happens after the Fed cuts those rates in September, right? What happens with commodities? Listen, if you look at the past year, we're down about 7% in regards to GSG. If there's a situation where the Fed cuts and we start to see this GSG spike, it's not going to bode well for the economy. It's not going to bode well for the stock market. Okay. And let me show you something that's very interesting. So by the way, this is crude oil, you know, crude oil down about 18% in the past year. That's the best scenario possible for the consumer. That's the best scenario possible for the economy. I mean, at the end of the day, that's just, it's almost like a tax, it's almost like a tax break, right? If you get to pay significantly less, let's say 50 cents a gallon less this year than you did paid last year, it's a win. That's like a tax cut, right? But here's the issue. The Fed started cutting, if we look prior to the great financial crisis, right? The this Fed started cutting around, what was that, September 07, right? Oil at that time, guess where it was? Very close to where oil is right now, in the low 70s. And then the Fed starts cutting, and commodities in general start spiking huge. Oil starts spiking huge. And oil, next thing you know, is over $140 a barrel. You're looking at many states around the United States paying $4 plus a gallon. People were never paid $4 plus a gallon for gas. It was shocking to pay those sorts of amounts, right? People were used to paying a dollar, two dollars a gallon for gas. And next thing you know, people got hit with $4 a gallon. It was shocking to people, right? Now, we're, we deal nowadays with three and four dollars a gallon uh, in many states, even when oil is super low. So nowadays, if we saw any sort of 2x in oil price like we saw back then, right, we'd be looking at easily six to eight dollars a gallon for gas right let's hope that doesn't happen but it is a risk it is a huge risk and if we see that i can just tell you the consumer will be done and we will be in for a massive recession after that because that was part of what led us to that massive recession people had already been hit heavily by the fed raising interest rates for years right additionally had already been hit by inflation for several years and that was just the last straw. That was the last straw in regards to that commodity super cycle we kind of went through there for about a year. Oil going higher. If we went through some similar, I'm telling you guys, we're done. So we're done. So the consumer's barely clinging on right now. They can't take it. If they, if we would, if next thing you know, everybody has to pay double the amount for a gallon of gas. I'm gonna just tell you guys, it's gonna be nasty out there. So keep an eye on this, right? Keep an eye on this. Very, very important. Now. Here's a look at the NASDAQ and what everybody's preparing for. So if we think about the last two years, we have a similar phenomenon going on. Basically, the last two years, the market's bottomed in October, right? And it's bottomed in kind of early to mid-October the last two years. And so people are thinking in regards to this, there's a natural kind of thought process about market goes lower here, and then we bottom around mid mid to early October, essentially, right? And that's what we saw last year. And then we bottomed out the market and next thing you know, it went up significantly. And I hear a lot of people talking about this. I reacted to a video today where people were talking about this, right? On the reaction channel. And then if you look back at the 2022 market, basically we kind of had like a triple bottom scenario. We bottomed out the market kind of early October, then mid October again. And then we had a little bit of tax loss harvesting there at the very end of 23 and kind of triple bottom this baby out. But essentially, you know, people really look, and this is looking at the NASDAQ, people really view 22 bottom as October, 
right? And that's where you saw countless stocks bottom was kind of in that October time frame there. So we've had now two years where basically you bottomed out the market in October. So now people are thinking, they're running to this conclusion that the same thing's going to happen this year, right? Keep in mind, just because something played out the last two years like that, like the stock market's been around a long dang time, 100 plus years, does not mean that's going to keep playing out that way, right? There's plenty of time periods I can show you out in the past where the stock market went lower uh, in, in late October into November into December, right? It's not like it's a guarantee that, oh, you know, mid-October, late, uh, mid-October is going to hit and we're up. We're up from there. When everybody starts thinking in that same frame of mind, you know, usually you're going to be in for a, d- a different situation. Now, what I'm showing you here, right here, is the average monthly performance for different months in the stock market. What do you see when you look at this? You should see something very important. What do you see? You see that September, right? It's freakish. Like, what the heck, man? Like, what the heck is going on here? I mean, clear as day, September's an issue month for the market. Now, everybody knows this. This is no secret, right? At least if you've been in the market a long time, this is no secret. You should know this. So the moral of the story is the market should go lower this month, right? But if everybody thinks one way, it doesn't mean it's going to happen one way, right? So I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. This right here shows you the average monthly performance of the different indexes by month. And look at September, man. It's horrible. 1.1% on average down for the Dow. 1.2% on average down for the S&P 500. 0.9% down for the NASDAQ. And 0.6% for the, for the Russell. And this is why I believe the market actually went significantly lower here today on the first trading day of September. I believe the algos look at this sort of stuff. And the algorithms say, you know what? Market's going to be bad. It's always bad in September. Sell, sell, sell. I believe that's what plays out, right? And I do have questions if that is going to play out. Because once again, when when the market's just thinking one way, I get, I get very suspect. When everybody's thinking one way, I get very suspect of that actually playing out, right? You get the first day of September. It seems too perfect, right? First day of September. The NASDAQ flushes down 3 plus percent. The Russell flushes down 3 plus percent. The very first day of September. Seems like a trick. Seems like a trick or treat situation. That's a little suspicious, right? So we'll see. Maybe it is just another bad September out there, right? But it's very suspect. I'll tell you that. It's very suspect. And like I said, I always kind of look at the contrarian side. What is everybody expecting? Everybody's expecting stocks lower in September, stocks lower at the beginning of October, bottom out mid-October, and then we're off to the races from there. And then I start thinking, what if the opposite happens, right? I I don't know. We'll see. I'm just going to say too suspect, way too suspect with today's price action. Like, why? If if you were convinced the market's going down in September, why wouldn't you have sold Friday? Think about that for a moment. If you thought the market's going down in September, why not sell Friday? Why wait to the first trading day of September? It doesn't make any sense. Like, like think about it for a moment. It doesn't make any damn sense. So, suspect. Suspect in regards to that, right? Now, we even have Tom Lee this morning going on CNBC. I reacted to that video on the Reaction Channel along with like five other videos, right? And Tom Lee says he's cautious on the market the next eight weeks. I mean, that's another one of those... I think that's another one of those suspect things that like why on the first day of September does somebody that's so well known in the stock market like a Tom Lee go out there and say he's cautious on the market the next eight weeks like why not have done that last week right that's one of those things I start to think about I mean Tom Lee goes on CMC pretty much every week he should I reacted to Tom Lee's video last week he should have that one should have been I'm cautious on the market the next eight weeks be very careful in this market the next eight weeks right like why why did it have to be today so I don't know man there's just a lot of weird things going on out there that I'm like Hmm, this is suspect after suspect, right? Now, in regards to what do you do in this market? Do you buy? Let's talk about some shorting opportunities, some put opportunities, those sorts of things. Now that we just went through this next 25 trading days or so, it's going to be absolutely insane for the market. We have so many big things going on. It's ridiculous, right? So if you watch my video I put out on this channel yesterday, right? That's a, like one of those videos that is just a value video. It's just telling you uh, a lot of things. I went through 85 different points in that particular video, right? 85 different points, 16 years of stock market advice in 52 minutes. One of the points I went through of those 85 points was what? I said, you need to put yourself in a position where you're able to do what? Buy stocks at least twice a month, right? 
And I put myself in a position where I'm able to buy stocks every single week. Every single week, public account, Patreon portfolio, and my private portfolio, I buy stocks every single Friday, right? As unless the market's not open, I'll buy on a Thursday. So you need to buy this entire dip. I don't care if we, this, we only dip this week or we dip for this entire month and it's a bad September as it is very often. Or I don't care if we dip for the next year, right? Let's say the market's just bad, crash, blah, 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 whatever, okay? You need to buy the entire dip the whole way. You don't know when the bottom is. That's facts, right? And so given that you don't know when the bottom is, you need to buy the whole dang dip because no one does ever know when the market is going down, whether it's for a week or for a month or a year. No one knows when it's actually going to stop or what, what's going to happen there, right? I mean, what if we're just, this is a really bad week for the market. Everybody gets convinced September's going to be horrible, right? So they just all throw in their cards and all the, the, the you know, let's call it the weak hands that all sell this week, Right? And then buyers step in next week, the next week, the next week, and we just go higher and higher and higher and higher. Everybody buys NVIDIA dip and all these other dips. And next thing you know, all of a sudden it's like, wait, September ended up being a good month. And we start out the month so horrible. Is that impossible? No, of course it's not possible, right? And we do know if there's a time you got to worry more about the stock market, it's not before the Fed starts cutting rates. It's after the Federal Reserve starts cutting rates, you got to worry more about the market. The Fed hasn't even cut yet. Let that sink in for a moment, right? So as I pointed out in that video, one of my 85 points there in that particular video, you know, you, you got you to gotta be buying basically every week or every other week. Additionally, let's talk about some potential hedges. So I have, this is my potential hedges watch list for 2025. I'm going to be setting up some hedges. I really want to set them up in October, November. We'll see. Okay. Now, these are potential hedges that I look at. I don't know if I'll play any of these. We'll see, right? Some of these I played in the past, made money on, you know, some of them I haven't yet. We'll see. So Coinbase would be a play on Bitcoin going down. I don't know if I really want to play that. Coinbase has already been, the stock's been hit a lot. Bitcoin is acting too stable, I feel like. Like, like maybe it's because of all the ETF buying recently, but Bitcoin's been really stable. Uh, you even look at a day like today, you know, it used to be like if NVIDIA stock was down 9%, Bitcoin's going to be down like 9%, if not 19%, right? And I look today, you know, with, with all the weakness in NVIDIA, AMD, those risk on stocks, looking at Bitcoin today I actually held up very, very well, which is, you know, I think it's a very good sign for Bitcoin as far as that, that, that standpoint, right? The one thing I'm concerned with with Bitcoin is it's getting too attracted to the Trump narrative in terms of there's a lot of like momentum and thought about like if Trump gets in office, like crypto is going to boom, those sorts of things. And then if he doesn't win, then it's a risk factor for Bitcoin on the downside. So that could be an interesting potential play. Toll Brothers, as far as that as a potential hedge, that would be more on existing inventory spiking big over the next year. And essentially, you know, these, these new home builders have had a huge advantage for the last several years. All of a sudden that advantage goes away and the market, the housing market gets a lot more competitive. We'd see, we'll see about that. I don't know. Okay. Wingstop valuation, that would be a play on valuation. Caterpillar would be a play on construction spending slowing down majorly in 26, 27, right? Let's say we got an economy that continues to cool, get colder and colder over the next year. That could mean really bad construction spending in 26 and 27, right? Which would obviously very negatively affect Caterpillar. Costco would be a valuation play there if we went against that one. And then Chipotle, which I already made a lot of money on. I have no negative position on Chipotle now, but I wouldn't be against getting back into it. There'd be a play more on sales going the wrong way in 25. And then, you know, obviously it's got a rich valuation on it. It is suspect that the CEO of Chipotle left for Starbucks. I that's a great opportunity. It's just, if you really thought Chipotle had so much growth over the coming years, right? You look at Starbucks, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a freight train, right? Like there's not the, it's not really a growth company. Like Starbucks at this stage of their life cycle, they're value and dividend stock and that's it, right? They can grow a little bit, you know, each year uh, in future years, but it's not like that's like a Chipotle story where it's like they can grow so many more restaurants and all this and that, right? And so I'm like, if Chipotle was really a great opportunity over the next few years, why would he leave Chipotle and go to Starbucks, that dinosaur, right? And so I do wonder if there's going to be more systemic problems and maybe Mr. Nicole was like, let me get out of this uh, now. Oh, my, my iPhone's getting low on battery. Okay, thank you for the link. You're all right, man, all that. Uh, Estelle. You know, I've looked at this one and I thought about Estelle a little bit. So Estelle is a 3X leveraged, basically inverse of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right, on a daily basis. So I have thought about Estelle a little bit as a potential hedge, buying some Estelle. But 
The issue with Estelle, right, that I don't like is some of these stocks or these stocks people like to run to when they're feeling a little bit concerned, right? So if I look at like a United Health, that's a perfect example of a stock people run to if they're a little worried about the market. Microsoft, same exact situation. McDonald's, same exact situation. So these are the Amex, they don't have the richest valuations on them right now. Uh, Apple's a little rich, so there's that, but you know, obviously people are willing to pay a lot more because the services side of the business now. So I don't know, man. I, I do look at S down and I'm like, it might be safer than playing some of these individual stock plays if I was to hedge, but I don't know if I love S Dow. Then there's SQQQ, which is basically an inverse 3X leverage index against the NASDAQ on a daily basis, right? So looking at the Qs, we got some problems here in terms of it's a tough play as well. Because here's the deal. Apple could short-term bottom in, you know, like let, let's say two weeks from now, right? Let's say Going into the going into the iPhone day when they show off the new iPhones, and let's say after that the stock goes down a bit, okay. I still think the iPhone cycle is going to be really good, and you're going to hear a lot in late September and into October about iPhone sales are booming, and they're selling really well, blah, blah, blah. That's likely what you're going to hear, and that's going to be very good for the stock, ultimately, probably in October or November. So... I don't know. That's tough. Microsoft is just a beast. It's hard to say anything bad about them. NVIDIA, honestly, should, could short-term bottom this week. If this DOJ thing freaks people out, right, you get a bunch more weak hands to sell. You get a bunch more commentary about worried about AI spend and all those sorts of things this week. You get some more bears talking about NVIDIA. This stock could short-term bottom this week. This week. So... I don't know. We'll see if it if it flushes big this week. I, there's a potential, a real potential that it could short term bottom this week, and so I would just you know that's a little something to be a little careful of. If they bottom, then Avago like a lead bottoms this week as well. Meta and Amazon are a buy right now on a valuation basis, so those are tough stocks to bet against. Costco, obviously rich valuation, we all know about that. Tesla, whew, you know that October event hype is going to be for real, right? And it's going to start in late September, so that makes it tough to. You know, the Tesla should, if anything, do pretty well at the end of this month and into, uh, you know, the beginning of October, at least. Google McDougal has a cheap valuation. If we look at these three stocks on, on 1000xstocks.com right here, right? Look at this. Two-year forward P on Amazon, 28. A 20 for Meta and a 16.9 for Google? That's dirt cheap for those stocks. Dirt cheap. I mean, those are three of the most quality companies really in the stock market. When you think about like the most quality of quality. And so the fact that they're trading down there, I mean, could you get those stocks down 5%, 10% from here? Sure. But could you get them down 20%, 30%? I think that's very difficult. So I think you have to be very tactical in kind of betting against those stocks, which makes a bet on SQQQ. I think it's a little bit difficult right now. I'll be honest with you guys. After this week, that is. As after this week, I think it's a little bit more difficult. If it's for just the next few days, maybe it's a moneymaker. But for the next... You know, let's call it the next six months. I think it's a little difficult there, right? What about betting against the Russell, the Russell 2000? You can say, well, if there's a lot of worries about the economy, worries about the market, the Russell 2000, the small cap stock's going to get hit heavy. Do you really want to bet against the Russell? Do you really want to bet against small cap stocks? These things haven't done anything for three years. Three years. So I don't feel comfortable betting against an index that has gone nowhere for three years. Additionally, if there's one thing we know about the small cap stocks, they're usually held down by the Fed cutting rates. And so there could be, there's a high probability that when the Fed starts cutting rates here, people are going to look at these Russell type stocks and they're going to say, this is where we need to be positioning into the market, right? We need to be in the Russell. We need to be in the small cap stocks. So I don't know, man. I, I don't think the Russell really attracts me as a, uh, to bet against those, right? What about betting against oil and gas companies? Well, if there's more worries about recession that comes out here over the next short term, oil and gas doesn't always do the best in recessions. We know that. I don't feel comfortable betting against these guys. There's a few risks here. One is you don't go into that major recession, and so oil and gas stocks do very well. Second big risk, I think, here is oils. We already spoke about oil earlier in the video, right? Oil is already in a major downtrend. That trend should break rather soon. Third risk is what happens if a 2007-2008 situation happens and Fed starts cutting rates and commodities and oil start running huge. You're going to lose everything on, on those bets against those oil stocks. So I don't feel great betting against those stocks here, I can tell you that. Mm -mm. So those don't really attract me. And so there's a lot of like, 
it's tough to bet against some of these markets right now. I gotta be honest. And you know what? But I don't like some of the price action I'm seeing out there. For instance, like Wind Resorts. Wind Resorts is a stock uh, I'm actively buying right now. I really like the stock. I think it's a great deal. But I don't like the way the stock's reacting in terms of it almost feels like they see something bigger coming here, right? The fact that the stock is so weak, the numbers are so great in regards to win, right? The numbers are great. It has a cheap valuation on it, right? And yet the stock just goes lower. And this just seems like there's no buyers other than me. I think I might be the only person in the stock market buying this stock right now, right? And the stock's lost about a quarter of its value in the past year. And I'm like, why does this company have great numbers, a cheap valuation, and yet no one wants to own it. It almost feels like maybe people are feeling around to recession, right? So I don't know. That, that's just a little food for thought in regards to that. It's suspect. It's like one of those other things I look at that's a little suspect. By the way, if you didn't get to see the video I posted a couple days ago on the channel, Four Stocks I'm Buying September 2024 edition, one of the stocks was Wind Resorts that was featured in that particular video. That was one of the four stocks. So if you guys didn't get to see that, I know a lot of people were kind of checked out over Labor Day weekend. I was out here making content for you guys, even if you were checked out, right? Now, in regards to these value and dividend names, I told you guys, I expect these stocks to do a multi-year bottom in the fourth quarter this year. And I still expect that. I think regardless of what happens in the market in 25, 26, I believe many, many of these stocks, multi-year bottom, multi-year bottom. We're not talking about one-year bottom. We're not talking about six-month bottom, multi-year bottom. And I'm looking at a lot of these guys, the Nikes, the Wind Resorts, a lot of these stocks, I think they will. I think if you get some more weakness in September, it's one of those weak times, right? And then you're going to get tax loss harvesting around this time. I think it'll be a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think they're all going to bottom at the same exact time. I think you'll have some that bottom in October. I think some will bottom in November and some will probably bottom at the end of December. But ultimately, I do look at a lot of these great dividend and value names, the Nikes and the, the Wind Resorts and a lot of these different stocks as bottoming and doing a multi-year bottom essentially during this fourth quarter of this particular year, right? Which, which, by the way, that would be very similar to kind of what we've seen in the past in regards to some of these big bottoms. Now, a lot of times people throw out this whole, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. It's a generational buying opportunity in regards to stocks, right? So I've been in this market 16 years now. And I can only say in that 16 years, which is a long dang time, right? It's a lot of months in the stock market. 16 times 12, what's that? Listen. There's only a few times I've ever seen truly generational buying opportunities, okay, in my 16 years in this market. So one was when I was first getting started in the market, 08, 09. Man, I wish I had money back then. I had like, like pennies back then, right? And so I wasn't really able to buy stocks away. I was like, I'd buy stocks like $500 worth at a time, $250 worth. Like a, if I bought, you know, even $1,000 back then, it was a huge amount of money for me. So that late 2008 through 2009, that was a generational buying opportunity for the entire market, entire market. Late 2018, in my view, was another generational buying opportunity for the entire market. A little tech heavy, but the entire market. Another generational buying opportunity in the past 16 years was April 2020. And that was, the Fed had completely reversed by that particular time. It was, it started to become more clear that the economy wasn't going to be closed down for three years and those sorts of things like people were talking about back in March. And so April 2020 was an, a generational buying opportunity for the entire market. Late 2022 was very specific. There was not an entire, there was not a generational buying opportunity for the entire market. It was for a generational buying opportunity for one particular group of stocks, tech stocks. It was a generational buying opportunity for Shopify, for Netflix, for Meta, for Apple, for Nvidia, for Amazon, you know, Tesla fell to $100 a share, those sorts of stocks. That was a generational buying opportunity, right? AMD, did I mention them? AMD went to what, 75 bucks or so? Generational buying opportunity for tech stocks in late 2022, but not for the whole market. Not for the whole market. Late 2024, this year, it's another, in my opinion, generational buying opportunity. But the difference is it's not for the entire market. It's not for the whole S&P 500. It's not for the whole NASDAQ. It's not for tech stocks. It's a generational buying opportunity this time for value and dividend stocks. We have countless value and dividend stocks. And it's not for all of them, by the way. It's, it's really for some of the most famous best names. Generational buying opportunity. You're getting many of these stocks at five-year lows, seven-year lows, 10-year lows, that like never happens. And so I, my view is this is a true generational buying opportunity, but it's in those sorts of stocks this time, okay? 
Alrighty guys, appreciate you joining me for this beast of a video here today. I'm gonna to put two things as pinned comment down there today. One is I'm gonna put my Patreon. If you like enjoy my content, you wanna support my content through Patreon, I'll put that as a pinned comment here today. You also get access to see the stocks I'm buying and selling each week, being part of that Patreon, okay? Additionally, the second thing I'll put down there as a pinned comment is if you're looking to apply to join my private stock group, private wealth group, elevate your knowledge game, as well as get access to 1000xstocks.com, I'll put that as like the second pinned comment down there today, okay? Other than that, I produce you guys two valuable videos over the weekend. One's about stocks I'm buying now. The second video was obviously on um, you know a lot of different tips, 16 years of stock market advice in 15, 52 minutes. So if you didn't get a chance to see those videos over the Labor Day weekend, definitely check those out. Much love and have a great day.